Welcome to the MIT at Innovation Program podcast. This is a repository of insights by thought leaders and practitioners of innovation where they speak about their views, insights and experiences. Come join us. Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Driving innovation in the unmanned touchless retail space. I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker and innovator, Mr. Arun Khattar, founder and CEO of Vendigan Technologies Private Limited. He is also a former international tennis player. Arun started his entrepreneurial career at the young age of 22 after graduating with a bachelor's degree in finance and economics from the Lenoir Rhine University in North Carolina. Arun is the founder and CEO of disruptive unmanned self-service retail technology startup, Wendigan Technologies, which in three years has established a presence in more than four countries with its patented technology for unmanned automated vending machines and self-service kiosks. In the past, Arun had founded a startup, Wiria Technologies, in the EM governments and virtual and augmented reality solution space with a focus on projects with impact on society and has also worked and collaborated with various startups in the past. Arun is an avid sports fan and has formerly played tennis competitively at the national and international level, being a former top 15 player in India and top 800 in the world. Before we proceed to listen to Arun, I have a few updates to share about the session and the MIT ID Innovation Program webinar platform. So for those who are joining us for the first time today, I'd like to inform you that MIT stands for the four decade old Maharashtra Institute of Technology. ID stands for MIT's 15 year old pioneering Institute of Design. And MIT ID's one year innovation program focuses on the four pillars of design, business, technology, humanities. The key features and differentiators of this one year course are immersions, project-based learning, and humanities. So on behalf of Professor Harshit Desai, head of the innovation program and the core team, we are grateful to be amongst you all hosting this session today. Today's webinar will have our guest speaker, Arun, share his insights for the first half hour, followed by questions facilitated by me in the latter half hour. Uh, please read the chat for other important pointers that have been shared. This is our 21st industry interaction this season. And I, Priya Dhawan, Head of Collaborations, Branding and Outreach for the MIT ID Innovation Program, welcome you all once again to this thoughtfully curated innovation journey. Warm welcome once again, Arun. Over to you. Thanks, Priya. So, um, thanks everybody for making time and coming, uh, you know, coming to listen to me talk and uh, uh, Priya, thanks for setting this up. I appreciate it. So uh, just a quick, uh, you know, just before we get into the subject of unmanned touchless retail, um, just a quick uh, summary about, you know, just a quick background about myself, uh, just so you know, who, you know, who I am. Um, so I was born, uh, born and raised in Pune, lived here for about uh, 15, 15 years, about the 10th standard, moved out, uh, moved out to the US thereafter. Um, pursuing my tennis, uh, my tennis career, my uh, love for tennis, and the uh, you know the desire to be a uh, professional, uh, top professional tennis player. Uh, I I did I I went through high school, college in the U.S. I came back. I worked for a bit there. Uh, then again, after college, after graduating, and then decided to uh, pursue my dream of playing tennis again. Uh, for two years thereafter, between 2012 and 2013. Um, tennis gave me the opportunity to travel to about 40 countries, uh, taught me a lot um, uh, in terms of uh, failure. You know, as an innovator, you see failure as well. So I think early lessons in failure came in while playing tennis. And uh, so about in 2012, uh, 2013, uh, I wasn't as successful as I would have liked to be uh, uh, from a tennis standpoint, uh, wherein I decided it was a, there was a choice, either I go back uh, to work or I start something of my own uh, basis, which I came back to India and I set up, a, uh, I started my first venture, which failed miserably uh, in the first six months. And uh, of course, that was also in the mobile governance and e-governance venture. 
venture and uh, e-governance space. And I set up a second venture quickly in the same space, uh, which did fairly well. And we did a lot of significant work, especially in the government to citizen services uh, um, uh, sector, uh, slum rehabilitation, uh, affordable housing. Uh, so a lot of fulfilling work because of the societal impact that it had. And as that, uh, you know, while that was towards the towards the end of those projects, I did, uh, um, you know, that's where the journey began with uh, unmanned touchless retail. And it's, uh, it's an interesting story of actually how that began. Uh, I'd like to share that because uh, uh, it, um, so I had a friend who was working in a large IT company, which is uh, TCS for that matter. And uh, she, um, she had a bit of a predicament because she was in the, she, she had just had the onset of her, of her period and she was in the toilet and uh, she couldn't, uh, she, there was a machine of course that could dispense a sanitary napkin which she needed, but it was working on the, these five rupee coins. and. She unfortunately couldn't get access to that because she didn't have change like most of us don't. And um, so long story short, when she told me about this, that's when my, you know, uh, that's when I started looking up and trying to figure out, uh, I was surprised at that point because that's when 2000, you know, mid 2016 was when a paid DM and these folks had just come up. I was uh, surprised that there was no way to pay with your mobile and get what you need from the machine. Um, so that's when I started off first and I, we built up this uh, sanitary napkin vending machine, you know, cashless mobile operated and uh, 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 it, it started off as Convi Pay, so convenient payment Convi Pay. Um, and uh, with the advice uh, of a, a you know very influ a mentor who influenced the, my early career, he, uh, he uh, you know influenced me to make a shift uh, and move towards more uh, you know a digital ecosystem for the vending industry, which was uh, which was missing. Uh, that's where Vendikin came up. Vend is vend, and ekin in Sanskrit is simple, so simplifying vending Vendikin. So, so that's the that's the story. You know, just the background about myself and. Uh, you know, how Vendikin came to be and how I got into uh, unmanned touchless retail. So um, now uh, that, you know, that background's done, I think um, I'll step into a little bit about uh, the macro perspective of the retail industry and uh, why, how and why the, uh, why the time is now for unmanned touchless retail. Um, uh, the COVID crisis notwithstanding, I think that's just a shot in the arm for the, for the, for, for the unmanned sector. So, uh, so to jump right in. So retail is, is uh, the third largest sector in India and it's, uh, it contributes 11% uh, to the GDP as well as to employment. Uh, we've, if you look into, uh, sorry, just give me a second. So if you look at uh, emerging markets, among the emerging markets, this is an interesting uh, graph about how and why India and China still remain the biggest bets, quote unquote. And this is largely because if you look on the x-axis, you've got market potential and on the y-axis, you've got country risk. So India and China are are uh, really uh, conducive markets and uh, investor friendly markets, which is why they're considered um, uh, good bets. Sorry, I'm moving this around, but that's gonna happen as we, you know, as I keep uh, going from slide to slide. Um, so as we all know, you know, the internet penetration after geo and the gov Indian government's push towards uh, the, the digital economy uh, after demonetization has um, resulted one in gra a greater smartphone penetration and also uh, the usage of e-payments and mobile wallets, etc. So India, as I think most most of us know, that India is a large market for smartphones, but India is the second largest market in the world uh, for smartphones and accounts for nearly 10% of uh, smartphone sales globally. Now uh, on the on the mobile wallets and the e-wallet side, this is a very interesting piece. You've got, uh, you know, mobile wallets growing at a CAGR of 145%, uh, uh, which is uh, which is incredible. And you've um, people are more gravitating towards not just, you know, initially people would use uh, mobile wallets only for mobile prepaid recharges or peer-to-peer -peer transfer of money. That's how it uh, began uh, in India. But now it's quickly transitioned into an ecosystem as as most of the apps, whether it's a Paytm or a PhonePay or similar, 
uh, most of these applications would like to become a super app. Uh, and now with GeoMart and uh, uh, the WhatsApp play coming in, uh, that'll form that that'll change the dynamics. Uh, I believe so. Uh, now, while that's happening with the rising penetration of the internet and you've got rising use of uh, mobile wallets, what you're also seeing that retail fundamentally is changing. You've got uh, increasing customer expect consumer slash customer expectations. You've got mobile first on everything. You've got uh, the rise of new kind of uh, uh, non-traditional growth models. Uh, you've got shifting profit pools. What do you mean by shifting profit pools? Meaning there's some, in some cases, brands are going directly to consumers. Uh, in some cases, you've got uh, distributors and suppliers uh, uh, picking up the bulk off the margin. So it's, it's very interesting to see how the, the retail, uh, the, not just the supply chain, but the demand chain is evolving. More specifically to consumers. Now, consumers, of course, India, as we know, is a young country and Consumers, not just in India, but globally too, are, are becoming more and more sophisticated um, due to various reasons. But what's happening is uh, consumers are, it's, it's aware, it's, it's more instant gratification oriented. So um, I, I want a seamless experience. Um, uh, there's a specific way I want it. There's, uh, you know, I want a personalized experience. I want to have a great experience, a memorable experience. I want to be recognized and rewarded. I want to get loyalty points, credits, etc. So this is largely missing at this point uh, from the FMCG space. Um, if you were to look at it, because if you look at uh, if I'm buying, as an example, me specifically, I'm buying a Diet Coke almost, uh, you know, four or five times a week. And Coke doesn't know that I'm I'm buying, so they can't report me. So, so I think there are there are certain gaps in the industry that currently exist and are not matching the need uh, for you know this this evolved consumer at this point. So while um, while e-commerce uh, specific e-commerce specifically is you know it's been growing it's been growing at a rapid rate. Uh, in 2017, you had e-commerce down for 7%, um, uh, sorry, 3% of, um, of the retail market in India, and right, and it's projected by 2021 to be 7%. Of course, this was pre-COVID. These, these, uh, this data was December of 2019, so uh, this is likely to be much higher um, after post-COVID. So, um, the e so while you've got e-commerce, you know, growing at more than 32, growing about 30 to 30 percent plus a year. Uh, e-commerce still does not fulfill this just-in-time convenience. Now, what is just-in-time convenience? I mean, I'm at home, it's 11.30 p.m. Uh, I want to have a bag of chips or I want to have uh, and So e-commerce can't fulfill that need. Neither can a store because the store is closed. So the only way that can be fulfilled is through unmanned retail, vending machines, what I call v-commerce. So v-commerce to me is the only way, um, uh, the only way forward when it comes to meeting this uh, evolved consumers just in time, instant gratification need. So, so where does where does India stand, or how does the you know what does the globe look like when it comes comes to this week uh, when it comes to e-commerce you've got uh, uh, Japan and the US leading the pack for decades now when it comes to vending with five or six million odd vending machines um, compare that to in India which has 5,000 and China interestingly enough has added about a hundred thousand machines in the last uh, six or seven years <clears throat> so if I were to compare the per capita of of vending machines against um, uh, uh, citizens in just tier one cities in India and compare that to uh, a US or a, a Japan, India tier one cities, leaving aside tier two, tier three uh, uh, rural areas, India is 50x behind the world in e in v commerce. So let that sink in, it's 50x behind. Uh, the, of course, there's various reasons for that. I'm not getting into that at this point. I will get into it uh, a couple of slides later. So India is the fastest growing market, ironically, over the last two years at 40%. Um, globally, you've got uh, out of these 12 million, six, sorry, 16 million odd vending machines, you've got less than 5% uh, that are touchless. Now, touchless is more important after this current COVID crisis. 
the global vending market is has been growing at 14% and now post covid it's expected to grow at uh, 20% plus now taking that per capita of 50x you know what we talked about here the 50x india being 50x behind the world in e-commerce you've got india tier 1 cities urban areas having the potential to add 100000 new uh, machine slash kiosks per week this just in time convenience of e-commerce and there are about 100 million consumers that could leverage um, uh, leverage e-commerce as an avenue to fulfill just in time convenience so on a global standpoint you've got you know you've got about 18 million cabs i'm just giving some perspective here you've got 18 million cabs you've got 30 plus digital platforms for these 18 million cabs you've got 10 million um, plus restaurants and you've got more than 50 50 platforms uh, digital aggregator platforms for restaurants now let's look at the vending industry or the e-commerce industry you've got 16 million kiosks and vending machines globally and uh, i'd like to think uh, at this point vending is the only digital aggregator platform uh, i may be mistaken but there's no mainstream platform just yet for uh, for the 16 million odd kiosks and vending machines so e-commerce is a 22 billion dollar market and it's projected to grow at 20 percent uh cgr so what's the scenario sorry so what's the scenario post covid you know you've got a uh, pre covid vending machines were only in office spaces there was limited consumer interest and acceptance the vending machine was always the boring thing in the background um india of course was growing at 40% year on year for the last couple of years and uh, globally there's been 40, which is decent a 14% growth uh, but after the crisis has come in you've seen this need for minimal contact less personal interaction um, which is essentially the new normal when it comes to retail purchasing so limiting of touch there's a lot of this um, uh, hygiene mandates for face masks um, you know there's a focus on value for money which is interesting because uh, uh, people having less disposable incomes are less are more likely to buy uh, buy only what they need uh, you've got flexible labor working from home. Uh, there's a new sales channel uh, for, uh, so the way I see it, the e-commerce would be a new sales channel for small supplement, supplementary impulsive purchases. So what do I mean by that? I mean, um, e-commerce isn't, isn't going to replace an e-commerce or isn't going to replace your store. It's, it's just for those small supplementary and impulsive late night or snacking purchases. So that's the added value that e-commerce brings in, uh, which is more so important after uh, the crisis. And um, India is set to grow at about 100 to 150% and the globe at 23% plus the industry um, uh, bases the techno bases a techno avio report from uh, May 2020. There's been some interesting PPE vending machines that have come up right from Warsaw, Poland to uh, you know India, Tamil Nadu, and India. Vendikins doing a lot uh, of PPE vending machines as well. So, so there are ecosystem challenges i touched upon this in the last slide that think about yourself during the lockdown you know you've been uh, you've been stuck at home uh, uh, the stores are closed or maybe a, a fair bit of a walk away you just want to eat something uh, just have a small snack it's or buy even buy some essentials it's it's not it, it isn't practical to walk to the store and it's not convenient to walk to the store so there's a need for essential items uh, high selling products cold drinks energy drinks snacks chips um, and there's a lack of seamless access uh, so this is again a bridge that uh, you know unmanned touchless retail or e-commerce builds in. Uh, so how does Vendix digital platform help? One is this uh, one is our patented you know touch-free dispensation technology enabling a safer safer retail experience. Uh, the fastest method it's of course the fastest method to develop infrastructure. So if I wanted to set up a shop, it would it's not possible to set up a shop in the housing society if i it's easier for me to just set up a vending machine um limited you can limit hoarding through limitations through the app and digital purchases and lastly you also got the digital the, the platform the back-end platform for timely uh, fulfillment of these machines and of course and more importantly 24 7 access to food rations and products for uh, for citizens without having to step out uh, uh step outside 
So we had about uh, two, we've had about 2000 plus installations uh, across the country and we've just launched up in the UK, US and the GCC. Um, we had this campaign during uh, the lockdown which said step down, not step out. So um, it, this is all oriented towards uh, unmanned touchless retail. Now, this is again, this slide specifically is my personal opinion. Um, I, this is what I believe the future of e-commerce will be. Um, V-commerce will be the major new channel for online yet offline FMCG sales and connected retail. So what do I mean by online yet offline? So I'm buying it online on my phone, but I'm getting it offline in the machine. So it preps people for, uh, you know, uh, even if e-commerce companies would like to go into rural areas, it preps people to buy online and get immediate gratification. Um, also connected retail, you know, our machines have um, uh, advertising screens on them that allow for brands to have more targeted promotions or advertising uh, loyalty. So there's this aspect of connected retail, which currently doesn't exist. Um, another more very important piece is the micro entrepreneurship piece. So is having micro entrepreneurs leverage the digital platform to run a vending business, which is how uh, I believe 500 plus new vending startups. So I mean, micro entrepreneurs that would leverage Vendikin's platform uh, could come into play. A uh, hundred million plus uh, channel of sales for FMCG companies uh, through this, through the e-commerce, uh, through the e-commerce channel. So what's Vendikin's path been? You know, I think uh, just to throw, give some perspective as to, uh, you know, where uh, Vendikin, you know, how we started off, just my journey and the company's journey in this unmanned retail e-commerce space as the pioneer. Uh, started off in 2016 and 17 as ConvyPay, initially as sanitary napkin, touchless machines. Uh, the quick pivot was made into a more uh, digital technology for the vending industry specific overall. A vending in, a in simple vending, a vending in simplifying vending. Um, raised a bit of money, seed round in 2018, just with a few hundred installations, pre revenue. Uh, did some pilots with major brands, applied for some patents in the US, India, the UK, and EU. Um, in 2019 was a, a big year of growth for us. We signed Pan India contracts with major FMCG players and top vending operators. Uh, activated more than about a thousand machines launched in the UK filed our patents in the US in UK and in, in the EU um, got a patent granted in the US in December 2019 and did 10x uh, year on year growth from 2018 in 2020 uh, you know we've um, we've had more than uh, about two million transactions on our platform there's more than um, there's more than 30 customers that we have on board. We're a market leader in India with 40% plus market share. Um, launched in the GCC, the US, uh, the EU soon, uh, expecting some further grants in, in India and the US. Um, perfectly on track for 10x year on year growth and 1 million uh, US dollars in revenue. Some of the major customers that partners, as I'd like to call them, that we're working with below, uh, pretty much covers the expanse of uh, India's FMCG industry. Um, a lot of interesting projects in the pipeline, and I believe 2020 to 2021 is the year where unmanned, touchless uh, retail would really have its uh, have its moment over the next uh, couple of years. So I'll end with uh, end with a quick video that will you know give you some perspective. Um, um, not just on a snack machine, I'll show you a video on a coffee machine, which makes, uh, uh, which gives you some more perspective. So just give me a second here.
Arun, is there any sound to the video? Sorry? Is there any sound to the video? Oh, there is. Oh, sorry. I thought you couldn't, I could hear, you could hear it. Um, 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 sorry, I'll play that again. My fault. No worries. Coffee breaks give employees the opportunity and environment to break from the sedentary rhythm of office life, socialize and improve work relations, and rejuvenate them for new challenges. With Vendican, consumers are able to experience the refreshing taste of Nescafe without the hassle of carrying cash. Empowered by the Vendican consumer app, consumers need to simply connect to the machine by either scanning the Vendican QR code or entering the VPN. Once connected, the intuitive app will enable consumers to select one or multiple beverages in one go. Consumers can pay using one among the many payment options available through the app. Beverages are then dispensed automatically. While the consumers enjoy their break, the Vendican device enables the vending machine operator to get real-time information about the inventory level in the machine, as well as its performance. Vendican empowers vending machine operators by ensuring that there are no stockouts by sending alerts on their phone when inventory falls below a certain level. The Vendican operator portal ensures that machines are refilled in a timely and sustainable fashion to minimize downtime and increase profit per machine. Vendican is the first integrated solution for the vending ecosystem. Are you ready for this simple, smart, and seamless revolution? So yeah, I think um, uh, I'm pretty much, I've covered all the points that I would like to cover. So. Um, you know, happy to take any questions, comments, anything. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Uh, also, also a bit about your tennis journey, please. And then we'll uh, move on with the questions post that. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think tennis gave me a lot of uh, opportunity in terms of, uh, you know, travel, understanding the world. More importantly, I think failure, understanding failure, right? So I think um, the ability to... Uh, take care of setbacks and move forward. So I think uh, I don't have any pictures to share Priya at this point. So anybody would like, they could just Google. I'm sure they'll find some pictures. So yeah. Sure. Sure. Great. Thank you. So I think, uh, you know, thanks for your uh, presence on LinkedIn. Because uh, that's where I got to know about uh, Wendy Kane and about your journey. And yes, thankfully, that's how I also got to learn about e-commerce. We've all just been hearing about e-commerce. So it was always uh, good to know that, okay, there's something coming up uh, from a Pune car, I should say. <laughs> so congratulations on that and uh, helping Pune shine on the list of innovations domain. Sure. Thank you. Um, I'd like to circle back to the, uh, you know, to your uh, earlier journey. Uh, you were born in Pune and then you moved to the US. Mm -hmm. uh, again, studied there, worked there. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's where your, uh, I think uh, the, the tennis circuit went live as well. Mm -hmm. And then you relocated to Pune. Uh, mm -hmm. How was the transition for you in terms of, you know? I think it was a, a transition in a sense. Um, if I were to look at it, I think, uh, um, uh, of course, the stark differences between the two places, no doubt. But uh, um, I think it was the, the whole reason I wanted to come back was, uh, I think India is a country of massive potential just purely because of the amount of people we have and consumption uh, consumption so I, I always believed in uh, uh, India being the future and which is why I which is why I came back uh, if, uh, if that answers your question but uh, from a transition standpoint um, I, I think it was quite seamless you know in Rome do as the Romans do right so um, yeah do in Pune as the Pune girls do great <laughs> thank you um, you also mentioned about, I mean, you know, you've used this word, uh, you know, a couple of times, failure. Um, yeah. How about uh, terming failure, you know, more like a growth uh, point of view or more like an evolution? Uh, why do we really uh, need to, as such, mention about failure? Why don't people address it as, you know, okay, this was more like about uh, exploring your potential, trying out new things, sure. and therefore it was your growth journey, your evolution journey. 
Yeah, I think I think we've just put a negative connotation towards failure, right? I think uh, when somebody says the word failure, I think people immediately have an, uh, a negative uh, negative uh, image that comes to their mind. To me, I, I I think exactly like you said. I think it's an it's an opportunity for growth, right? So, um, so I, I agree with you. I think it's just a stepping stone to. Uh, I wouldn't say success, but stepping stone to the next level, right? At least you don't fall into the same hole or you avoid falling into the same hole again. Or, um, and like they say, you know, what doesn't kill you make you stronger. Class cliche as it sounds. True, true. All right. Um, you also mentioned in your, uh, you know, talk earlier, you mentioned mm -hmm. that there were actually 6 million vending machines, am I right, in Japan compared yes. to, let's say, only 5,000 in India. Y yes, yes. Have you had any chance to visit Japan yet or, you know, sort of collaborate in any way? Have you actually just been to the country? I have, I have, I have. I've had some very interesting, I think, uh, uh, I was uh, uh, fortunate enough to, uh, to you know, meet the CFO of uh, one of Coke's largest bottlers in Japan. And about a year and a half, year and a half ago. And it was uh it's it, japan is an interesting uh, you know culture i really can't point out as to why uh, they have such an uh, you know uh, uh, such a high number of vending machines i think common sense tells me that uh, real estate costs uh, more enterprising for, you know enterprising folks i shouldn't say more but enterprising folks i think india has been largely limited the growth in india as compared to a japan and the us has been largely limited because um, uh, you know, high capital expenditure and imported equipment and MRP limiting the gross margins on, on uh, you know, product sales. So what happens is the payback for an expense, the operating margins and operating margins stay very thin for somebody running a vending business because of high capex and uh, limited sales because of MRP. So um, what we are trying to do with Vendikin is uh, increase these operating margins and bring a payback from maybe 36 months to 48 months to something like 18 months. Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, could you also, you know, share with the audience about the recent deal with Middle East? Yeah, we've tied up with a, a very large uh, uh, fintech player called Marshall. Um, Marshall is one of the oldest fintech companies in uh, in the GCC, they provide POS terminals. Um, uh, they've got an 85% market share in terms of POS terminals, these credit card swiping machines. Uh, so uh, they've, uh, they're building a super app for the GCC and uh, Vendikin uh, is providing our vending technology for touchless dispensation in the end-to-end -end digital aggregator platform in the back. So we've tied up with them for the GCC and uh, in the next few weeks, I think you should hear something on the US side as well uh, with a large player there. Super. Because I remember when I saw the news, I was like, okay, that's been quite a productive quarantining quarter for you. So I think I think the touchless has created a lot of... Uh, you know, interest, uh, whether it's a coffee machine or it's a snacks machine. And it's, uh, I think it's a period where new habits will be created and um, people, uh, uh, minimal contact retail, I shouldn't even say touchless completely, but minimal contact retail is definitely uh, going to be the way forward, no doubt. Sure. And since you mentioned it was a startup, so have mm -hmm. you also been working from home earlier or uh, there's been a full-fledged uh, uh, office uh, environment to go to no, no, before from lockdown home. set in? Uh, no, uh, b before or after lockdown set in? Before lockdown set in. Oh, before lockdown, I mean, I mean, we've had, we've got a team of 40, uh, 45, uh, 40 folks in Pune and a couple of other people in other cities. So mm -hmm. uh, yes, full-fledged office, uh, everybody works out of the office. Uh, of course, during the after the crisis, you know, safety comes first. Uh, everybody's at home. The soft, our team is largely a software team. So I would say 20, 20 to 25 of our folks are, uh, you know, can easily manage from home. Uh, the infrastructure also was built such with laptops, etc. So it was fairly uh, easy for people to work from home. Um, but um, uh, the other folks, some of my folks, I've got some, of, some very brave guys on the team who, you know, understood uh, the need for vending machines in housing societies, and we did some uh, did some work uh, by putting out 15, 20 vending machines in housing societies to give large housing societies at least access to uh, you know 24/7 access to rations and food. 
so they so stepped would... out those are the only guys stepping out all right all right and what has been the use of feedback since of course i've seen you also in some of the pics so it seems like you were actually on the ground uh, yeah i mean if i uh, as well. yeah i think it's uh, if i'm not on the ground then why how can i expect my team to be on the ground right so i think True. it was uh, it was more to just make sure of course that things things are everything's in place and uh, uh feedback i think has been interesting i think people uh you know want to control uh, the people in societies want to control what they uh you know what they get at vending machines which is uh sometimes possible sometimes not possible um but the feedback has been good because it's been convenient it's been easy uh we've been had having a lot of more societies ask us for machines uh, ask us for vending machines uh production supply chain has been a lag of course electronics everything taking its time but the plan is to uh so you know have a new work vertical that works just in pune and mumbai at least for the next 3 to 4 months and our goal is to put out about 200 to 250 machines uh, in these housing you know the large housing complexes um over the next 3 uh, months 2 to 3 months but the reason we are we are we're focusing more on uh, large societies is because uh, um is more of a business standpoint right the unit economics don't work out otherwise in all honesty sure sure thank you so uh, yes there's a whole lot of uh, i would say a great picture to look ahead to is vendic in hiring i mean would you be needing more resources what are the plans ahead yeah i think uh, you know we're always looking for strong tech talent i think uh, uh, tech i mean yes we definitely are i mean we we are definitely hiring sure and uh, what was the thought process behind applying for patents in multiple countries I think I think the idea here is it's always been to make the make an old dumb machine smart right so you've got the old vending machines that you see all over the world how do you make those touchless and smart i think that was the primary goal so um uh, uh that's where you know ip comes in because it's uh the rock it's not rocket science to build what we are building and i look at it just as a first mover advantage despite the patents and ip being there so uh, yes of course it adds value to the company and it shows uh, you know um, uh, it adds a certain moat around your business right so uh, even though in a country like india maybe that's not uh, valued as much but uh, uh, valued as much in a sense that people disregard it and they can copy your solution which we have seen so um so i think it's um, it's more to create a moat whether invisible or not around the business right and add value uh, to the company sure sure so today i say um, you know again is in case somebody wanted to order a vending machine mm-hmm. or even a self service kiosk mm-hmm. uh, how do they reach out to you uh that's a great question i think we so what we have done very quickly uh, initially it was just vending and selling to so we did not go directly outside of the vending operators and the fmcg brands right so we were selling to the vending operators selling to the fmcg brands but mm-hmm. now what's happened is we've um, we've set up master channel partners uh that work with us and act as our you know uh, uh, in very simplistic terms distributors of our machines but they they they've got their own domain expertise and uh so they do the end uh you know deployment and execution for us so somebody gets in touch with us we involve our channel partners master channel partners who help in the execution on the ground for the end customer sure and what was the major uh, bottleneck that you came across other than supply chain of course anything that you felt that was well, something that um, really needs a very big push uh, you mean during the lockdown uh, bottleneck or yeah i mean since anyways vendic in a sort of come to the fore i would say more during the covid uh, crisis and the need for you know touchless unmanned uh, retail space so I- from that point of view i think there has been uh, you know while the medium term and the long term for the unmanned touchless space looks will looks very optim very positive i think the short term will see a lot of turmoil because uh, you've got vending machine operators uh, currently you know they survive with retailer margins and you know monthly service charges if i were to get into second and third level of detail so mm-hmm. um, there are there is an impact on the industry no doubt and i think the next uh, 2 to 3 months are going to be tough 
for the existing vending, you know, uh, the, the ones that run the vending machines, the operators. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the medium term, in the long term, I believe uh, uh, because of the reasons I mentioned in the deck earlier, I think uh, the potential is immense. Sure. And there will be a lot of disintermediation, meaning brands, I believe, will go uh, will go directly to um, directly to consumers because brands being the OEMs have larger margins to play with, right? So that's a trend that we're definitely seeing wherein brands uh, are wanting to go straight uh, to uh, uh, straight to the consumer and use the vending machine as a brand recall and a point of presence and a point of not just a point of sales, but a point of brand presence. Sure, sure. Okay. So, uh how did you all work on the user experience and strengthen the interaction with the users? One of the participants would like to know. So I think it's a question of, there are a couple of things that we do, right? I think one is uh, initially, uh, you've got to break it down into a couple of things, you know, working hardware and software is not, uh, is not, it's not easy, right? Because you'll see a lot of, uh, you'll see a lot of challenges because an app is, very app oriented and with the with when it's communicating with the hardware you're going to face more challenges to build that seamless user experience so you've got to keep your ear very close to the consumer and listen to what people are saying whether it's messages whether it's comments whether it's actually in person conversation and uh, then try to quickly as as quickly as possible you know implement those changes into um, uh, into your solution now um, if that answers the question so is, is there like a, spe uh, a special team for, you know, who's again just yes. focusing on users and how big is the team? So I think uh, uh, I, we try to automate as much as possible. So if I were to look at, uh, there's, there's a tool uh, uh, that we were using initially that allows us to understand a heat map, right? Where mm -hmm. consumers are touching, which are the screens they're, they're not, uh, you know, the, which are the buttons they, you know, they're getting stuck on, they're getting confused. So there's a tool called AppSy. You can use that tool integrated now, of course, because that was on the old version of the app that we had. And on the new one, uh, mm -hmm. we've been uh, using uh, Google Cloud Platform and Google uh, gives a whole um, uh, host of analytics, uh, analytical tools that allows us to understand uh, you know, uh, more details about consumer experience and then modify the user experience accordingly. All right. Sure. Thank you. Um, how fast is the coffee dispensing machine and how much would it be costing? See, interestingly, we don't make the coffee machine, right? We, uh, hmm. we have, we've, uh, we've got the partners on partners in a sense. We've, uh, the brands that we working with our uh, Nestle, uh, uh, Georgia, Godrej, HV, Intocup, etc. We connect uh, to the brand and the brand that, uh, you know, provides the machine on a rental basis. And uh, um, that's, that's how the, uh, that's how it works. So, uh, so say as an example, you're an office, uh, uh, you own an office and you would like to have a touchless coffee machine. Then you uh, let us know. We let the brand know the brand approaches you, uh, or the host of brands will approach you. You can choose the machine you like and whichever machine you choose the touchless technology should, will be, uh, in there since we are working with most of the, uh, the coffee players on the snack side, uh, it would be the same. Um, except on the snack side, it would be Vendikins, uh, not just the technology, but also the machine in some cases. Sure. And the Vendikin machine would be costing a proxy how much? In case it were to be introduced in, let's say, you know, smaller housing areas or flats, gated communities, etc. See, it, it depends on which machine it is, of course, and the machines range from, uh, you know, a lakh of rupees to, uh, to, uh, to up to two and a half lakh rupees for more complicated machines. Uh, the model, though, for the housing societies, the way it works is minimum sales. And, uh, uh, you know, so they get the machine for free uh, as long as there is a minimum sales guarantee every month. Okay. And there was, I think, some point in time, also a campaign where you were running where you said that, okay, fine, housing societies could have the machines installed for free, but then again, it banks only on the sales done via the... That's uh, exactly, that's still yeah. what we follow. So that's exactly what we follow. And we also have, um, you know, you can have specific brand vending machines. So we're tying up with a lot of brands, local brands as well. There's some interesting brands that are coming up to the fore. I mean, of course, uh, I'm not supposed to uh, disclose that yet because sure. they will do their own marketing activities. But uh, 
you will see a lot more vending machines starting to approach, uh, you know, coming into societies and uh, brands uh, being the forefront of that. Mm -hmm. um, traditionally, vending machines, again, in India were more in office spaces, number one, and run by vending machine operators that multi-brand, they, they buy the machine, they invest in the machine, they put the products into the machine, um, mm -hmm. and they will earn from the sales of the product as well as a rental, a monthly rental that comes in. And in a housing society, earn from the uh, sales of product from a machine, but uh, the rental uh, goes away because higher sales. Sure, sure, thank you. Another question from Anuj here. So see, mm -hmm. all of us have seen uh, the traditional machines, right? We've always noticed uh, drinks and all being stacked out there. But is it possible to convert these existing traditional machines to a touchless format, which means that the rest of the machine stays the same, but only the interface is replaced by your touchless system? Yes, absolutely. So we that's our primary offering. We have a retrofitted device that is plug and play into any coffee or snacks machine that makes a, uh, makes a dumb machine smart. So, you know, we put our device on, on site itself and it's ready to accept uh, touchless payments. Okay. And how much would that, uh, you know, be the conversion uh, cost? Or the, uh, the conversion cost, cost is um, uh, depending on the number of devices between seven and ten thousand rupees. Okay, so you know, typically in Kirana stores, you normally see right, you've got uh, uh, maybe yogurt packs or you've got uh, cold drinks being stacked out there. So you're saying that those machines can be converted okay. with say about some ten thousand rupees plus whatever are the additional charges. So that's that's right? that's a that's a cooler, right? So that. That's what you yeah, call a busy correct. cooler. Then you've got a vending machine. The solution is the, the available for both. You've got one for a vending machine and you've got mm -hmm. one for a cooler. Now for the cooler, you can have an electromagnetic lock. Mm -hmm. It's not touchless, right? Mm -hmm. Because you still got to open that door. Right. But on the vending machine side, it'll be touchless. But on the on the cooler side, you'll have to pay. You'll open that. I'll, I can actually show you a video that's a smart fridge. So if, if actually maybe... Uh, sort of spending time now if someone would like to look at it they can go and look at Bendikin smart fridge and we can yeah. provide that same retrofitted solution for existing coolers at the price that uh, we, we discussed oh all right Thank so the you. flow will be like Bendikin smart fridge on 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 youtube okay sure thank you uh, how do you tackle with the damage to inventory costs of vending machines in our country um you know, with vandalism of public properties, of uh, uh, like vending machines or stealing purposes is very common. So is there any way around it? Sharon would like to know. Like, for example, Yulu and some other motorbike services like Bounce have witnessed damage of their, uh, yeah, you know. Yeah. I, I agree. I, I fully agree. And I think uh, the whole 100,000 potential that I talked about was only in captive audiences, housing societies and offices. Right. These two spaces are the untapped market. We're not talking about public places. Yes, if you go and put a vending machine on the road, it'll get destroyed. So mm -hmm. that's not the that's not the market that we are looking at. Even to build a hundred million dollar channel of sales, you're still going to be focused completely on captive audiences where the machine is safe and there's a security camera. Sure. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Vishal. He'd like to know that is there any major jump in business due to pandemic? And do you believe this opens a whole lot of new business opportunities for Vendikin across different product based industries? For sure. I think, uh, I think we've definitely seen, uh, you know, a, a growth in business uh, when it comes to uh, new avenues of business. Coffee machines is, an, is a great example. Uh, initially, coffee machines, our solution was used only for unmanned paid coffee machines. But now it's being used for, um, you know, just regular touchless dispense in the office space because people don't want to press those buttons. So that's an interesting uh, thing that's come up again for snack machines as well. In a traditional machine, you go put cash, you uh, swipe your card or you scan a QR code to transfer money and then you'd press the buttons on a machine. So for each product you purchase, you're going to have three or four, at least for three or four presses before you take out the product, three or four points of contact. Wherein in our solution, so if you're buying five products as an example, you're going to have 15 to 20 uh, touches onto the machine. Wherein with Vendikin, you can buy all five on your on the app and automatically dispense with only one touch essentially to collect from the collection area. And even that we're taking care of in some cases with UV light and you know pushing with the back of your hand. So uh, it reduces touch by at least 95%. 
as compared to uh, regular machines and that's why we've seen a significant increase on the uh, on the uh, you know in different avenues so and also then the ppe machines so people require touchless ppe machines so that's a new avenue that's been built up but at the same time you know it's not immune to the existing uh, issues in the industry uh, but yes long story short positives outweigh the negatives also. sure thank you uh, the hardest challenge for any startup is to connect at a level where the users incorporate it as a norm, meaning not a privilege, but a product. Mm. So how is Vendikin approaching this challenge and how are you making your product a part of your users' lives? I think, um, you know, we are a, uh, we're slightly different and we have, uh, it's, uh, you know, we have uh, more flexibility that way because in a vending machine, especially a legacy vending machine, or even our machines, we can, it's, there's, in an old machine, in a legacy machine, there's only one cashless pay device that can go into the machine, right? Or one, maybe maximum two. But there's a limited number of options if a person wants to interact with that vending machine. So they have to use the solution on that front, number one. On the, the new machines, it's our prerogative. So we have our app there. So the, the uh, you know, the resistance that we see to adoption is a lot less than a traditional B2C app, um, uh, which is why, you know, which is why we're different. But that being said, we're moving more towards an appless experience. We're doing some things in the R&D that allow us to go completely appless and not have to depend on our app or the integrations that we've done with the phone pay or even a PTM. Um, so we're, we're moving away from we're moving away from uh, the app side of the story, but to answer the question, resistance is minimal because uh, of the need. It's a need-based. Uh, uh, it's a need-based download. Sure, we'll take this last question for today. Um, can we commerce sell fruits and vegetables also? Very much. So I think that's the next thing that we're we're working on with uh, uh, with an FMCG company, wherein. Uh, vegetables and uh, you know essentials are being put in housing societies of course the scale time will tell because uh, uh, perishables have always been a strict no-no in machines because of wastage mm -hmm. uh, again uh, you know the first few 10 10 15 30 odd machines that we put out with fresh fruits and vegetables will uh, time will tell but there's no denying this perishable danger of wastage perishable foods wastage Sure, sure. So one of the participants would like to know, I'll, I'll take the last question. Uh, do you still play tennis and how do you manage your t time between your passion and your startup? Well, I actually have not, uh, you know, it's consumed my life. So I haven't hit a tennis ball in three, maybe four years, I think. Um, <laughs> the reason being I've, uh, I played 15 odd, you know, 15 odd years and uh, uh, I was lucky enough not to be really injured. So the longest I went for without playing was 10 days. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I've been so consumed with, uh, with, uh, the business and travel more than anything that I've not got a chance to go out and play tennis, which, uh, uh, now while I say it sounds crazy, but, uh, I, sp I do spend a lot of time, uh, uh, meditating and, uh, at least in half an hour a day meditating and, uh, at least an hour of a workout five times a week. I continue the workouts I did while I played tennis and, uh, yeah, I make sure I get my sleep, my seven hours of sleep as much as possible. Sure. Thank you. Great. Um, so for more questions, uh, do reach out to us offline on LinkedIn. A round of thanks to our participants for joining us today and special thanks to our guest speaker, Mr. Arun Khattar, for his time and the value at takeaways from his journey. We encourage you to connect with us via our social channels to know more about the MIT ID Innovation Program and upcoming webinars and online courses. I'd like to invite you all to our next webinar on Monday, 29th June. Our guest speakers are the founding team of Advent Lab. Meet Maitri Bhardwaj, she's a creative design strategist, Ishan Dubey, principal innovation consultant, and Sarthak Chandra, principal business consultant, who will be speaking about enabling innovation spirit in SMEs in India. Please register in case you haven't yet. For those interested in enrolling for the one-year course, we have last few seats left for the second cohort of this prestigious program that will fast track your career path. So log on to www.mitidinnovation.com to kickstart your 
innovation journey with a diverse set of co-innovators. So thank you once again, Arun. It was a pleasure listening to you. And everyone stay connected, stay safe, and please keep innovating every day. Thank you, Priya. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.